2012 lecture, How Cool Are Ectotherm Hearts? Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to the Society for this um, uh, prize. So, today I'm going to, or this evening, I'm going to talk to you about how cool ectotherm hearts are. And I wanted to start off by telling you about ectotherms and how many ectotherms there really are. Now, this is a, a rather confusing diagram, but I use it in all my first year lectures. And the reason why I like it because you've got all the different um, uh, classes of animals. You've got vertebrates here. These numbers are the number of species in each class by the thousands. So there are about 45,000 species of vertebrates. And you can see quite clearly then that the majority of species on the planet are ectotherms. Actually, quite a few of them are arthropods or insects, 350,000 beetles. But of the vertebrates, only 15,000 species are endotherms, and that comprises the birds and mammals, which means that the majority of species on the planet are ectothermic. And of the vertebrates that are ectothermic, more than 32,000 species are from fish more than all other vertebrates combined. So ectotherms are very successful, and they've colonized all environments on the planet. Here's an ice fish in the Antarctic, and the goby, which are in that hot um, uh, thermal vents, two aquatic, two aquatic environments. But they've also been able to colonize terrestrial environments. Here's the mudskipper, which can live very well outside of water, and if you'll forgive the potential exaggeration, maybe even colonize the air. So ectotherms are very, very successful species, living in a number of different environments. But because they're ectothermic and their um, uh, body temperature is controlled by external temperatures, environmental conditions can have a high impact on their physiology, and particularly on ectothermic cardiac function. So here's a beating heart, and we know that situations like changes in temperature have a dramatic effect on the heart. It affects both the pacemaker rate and the firing of the heart, but also the strength and the force of cardiac contraction. And so, not just temperature, but also um, other environmental perturbations like changes in pH or changes in hypoxia, and also toxicants, can all affect cardiac function. And so, really, I've spent, as, as mentioned, a, a lot of my career really trying to understand how cardiac function is maintained during environmental change. When the heart's exposed to so many different things, how does it keep beating? And a lot of these studies have kind of brought, brought me to, to studies from myself and from all my colleagues to say that the heart is really the linchpin of physiology. And if you're thinking about big, big events like migrations or um, reproduction or life history events that actually are responsible for becoming a successful species, you really need to be able to maintain cardiac function in the face of these environmental challenges. Of course, we all know this is becoming increasingly important. Um, we've got an era of climate change, and ectothermic vertebrates are particularly vulnerable to these changes in the environment. And so, to try and study how um, the ectothermic heart responds to environmental change, we've kind of taken this global approach where let's look around the hotspots of the world, and here's um, efficient hotspots, so let's find out how these animals are surviving. And this has been quite a lot of fun. It's taken me and my students to places like the Pantanal in Brazil, studying animals like the armored catfish. Now, this is the Pantanal in the wet season. In the dry season, these ponds completely dry out, and these fish are completely air exposed, um, sometimes stuck in mud. And so these animals have an am amazing ability to tolerate hypoxia and also high pH. We've also done some exciting work out um, in the conjunction with NOAA, research vessels in the South, South Seas and the South Pacific. This is me and my student, Gina Galley, and we were working on understanding um, how temperature affects depth distribution of pelagic species, the sharks, the tuna, the swordfish, in the pelagic environment. Quite a lot of fun. We've also been up cold, so it's not all warm weather. Sometimes we go up to, up to the north of Finland. This is, I mean, this is actually a, a frozen toad 
There's a, a freeze tolerant frog that has been um, uh, pulled out of the ice in Finland. And a lot of my more recent work has been in conjunction again with Stanford and really trying to understand the endangered bluefin tuna heart function and trying to understand how these animals are distributed in the environment and whether cardiac sensitivity plays a role in their environmental distribution. And this has also led to some toxicant work. We've recently been looking at how the bluefin tuna heart has responded to um, uh, the oil spill that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. And so all of these trips and all of this interesting, I think, studies back to the heart function have led to some skepticism amongst other physiologists. Certainly, Jared Diamond doesn't really necessarily think that comparative physiologists are doing the right things. We're studying strange species um, and exotic locations for no apparent reason. And what I hope to be able to present to you today is that there is a reason to study these exotic species, and they're not, um, they're, there is a very apparent reason. Firstly, to understand their vulnerability to climate change. But secondly, because these animals provide key insight into basic cardiac physiology. And because this is a physiological society, I'm really going to focus on this aspect of the research today. And I do have an ulterior motive, because what I'm hoping is that there's a few general physiology um, referees in the audience, and that after this talk, I won't get this rejection letter. While the findings may be interesting and relevant to animals such as turtles, it's not clear how they're relevant to the understanding of tolerances in mammals. Hopefully, I can show you that actually some of these things do have a lot of important relevance to basic understanding of physiology. So, how cool are ectothermic hearts? Well, first, I'm going to tell you a bit about them, then about the mysterious role of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then about the exquisite sensitivity of the sarcomere. All right, so an introduction. So here is um, a, a diagram of vertebrate hearts. And we know that the morphology of the vertebrate heart has changed over the course of evolution. So here's the fish heart, my favorite, in this corner, with this, its four chambers in series. So we've got the cytospinosis, which collects blood from the body, leading into the atrium, it's a thin-walled chamber, which delivers blood into the ventricle, a very strong contractile force that sends blood through this um, that chamber, which is the bulbous arteriosus, which prevents the strong contractile force of the um, ventricle from damaging the delicate gill um, uh, circulation, which sits right here. And so that's, that's the, the fish heart. And of course, this is the most prevalent vertebrate heart in existence. You move from the fish heart to the amphibian and the reptilian heart, which is a beautiful heart with two atria and a ventricle. The ventricle can be completely common, so one ventricle. But as you look across um, reptilian species, the um, degree of separation between the two ventricles can change. And that's actually a beautiful um, story, but I'm not going to tell you about it today. And then we get to the mammalian heart, or the bird heart, which is the two, um, two atria, two ventricle, completely separated systemic and pulmonary circulations that most of us are familiar with. So it's not just the morphology of the heart that's changed. It's actually this morphology has some implications in, in how cardiac output is um, maintained across vertebrates. Now, cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. And what we notice is if you look across vertebrate um, evolution, is that at this end of the scale, cardiac output seems to be more dominated by changes in stroke volume. And if you look at this end of the scale, cardiac output seems to be dominated more by changes in heart rate. So if you want to change the cardiac output, if you're exercising or you're excited and you need to increase blood flow to your muscles, then you can either increase the rate that you deliver it or the volume which you deliver it. Both are very effective, but it turns out that this is, um, the stroke volume is more fish and the heart rate seems to be adopted more by the endothermic vertebrates. And maybe there's some reasons why. So this is a figure that I like. This is from my PhD supervisor and I always, I always kind of come back to this. And this, this shows resting maximal heart rates in vertebrates. So we've got heart rate on this axis and body mass for a number of species on this axis. And the vertical lines, the peak is the maximum and the bottom is the minimum heart rate. So it gives you an idea of heart rate scope. And what you can see is a clear allometric relationship that we all know for, vertebrate, for um, mammalian species with a very large scope between minimum and maximum heart rate. If we come down here, this is the ectotherms. 
So there's just a number of ectotherm species. This includes fish, amphibians, and reptiles from all different temperatures. And what you can see, first of all, is that there's no allometric scaling in this group of animals. And secondly, that there seems to be a limit on the maximum heart rate that you see of about 120 beats per minute or two hertz. Independent of, of developmental size, independent of temperature, the hearts just don't seem to go much faster. So this limit in, in, in upper heart rate might have implications for excitation contraction coupling. I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Certainly, we know that environmental factors such as temperature or oxygen have a direct effect on cardiac frequency in ectotherms. And because ectotherms um, are more uh, vulnerable to changes in the environment, perhaps it makes sense that if frequency is either relatively fixed or massively um, uh, controlled by environmental conditions, then it might be worth modulating cardiac output through stroke volume. I mean, you can imagine a situation where you've got a fish swimming along at the top of the water column, it's 20 degrees, the heart rate's beating normally, it sees a bird fly over and so it dives down into the depths. Temperature changes by 10 degrees, the heart rate has a massive bradycardia, and all of a sudden the fish is trying to escape a predator, but cardiac output fails. Because this is not very well controlled because of the direct effect of temperature and heart rate, what you see is a corresponding increase in stroke volume so that cardiac output allows the animal to deliver oxygen and blood to its, its tissues and escape its predator. And indeed, the limited frequency modulation of ectotherm hearts is associated with a greater scope for volume modulation. If you look at rainbow trout, for example, the difference when they're exercising between minimum and maximum exercise is threefold changes in stroke volume. So there's a threefold increase in the volume that their heart can put out during exhaustive exercise. And if you think that's impressive, you should meet the turtle. Because the turtle is able to breath hold. And when it breath holds, it shuts down its um, metabolic rate. And when it slows metabolic rate, its heart rate can go from about 30 beats a minute to about one beat every five minutes. When it beats once every five minutes, it has a five-fold increase in stroke volume. So big, big increase in stroke volume. And of course, that strategy for modulating cardiac output um, is going to have big implications for the cellular length tension relationship because you're putting a massive stretch on the myocardium with that kind of blood load. I just put this on to remind myself that um, there is a, con a continuum. So it's not just that um, all ectothermic vertebrates or volume modulators and all endothermic vertebrates are frequency modulators. There is a continuum, and that's actually shown in this figure by this guy here, which is a skipjack tuna. And the tunas are fantastic. They're almost like mammal fish. They've got heart rates and um, blood volumes and um, blood pressures that are similar to compared to the sized mammals. And what you find is that these animals escape this two hertz maximum frequency, so they're able to actually modulate cardiac frequency more than the other um, fish that we've studied to date, and they also have very relatively fixed stroke volumes. So there's a continuum across this generalization that I'm making. So that's, that's the, the whole heart. What about the, the cardiac myocytes that make up the heart? So here are a number of images of a number of myocytes. Let's see if I can remember them. This is the rat. These are all the scale bars of 20 microns. This is the rat, this is um, with uh, diet anaps, so it's um, lighting up the cell membrane. And you can see the clear imaginations of the, um, the uh, T tubules. This is a turtle cardiac myocyte, this is a trout cardiac myocyte, and that's a zebrafish cardiac myocyte. And right away, the morphology seems very different. Certainly, there are no T tubules. So again, the majority of vertebrate hearts have ventricular myocytes that don't have T tubules. These myocytes are long and they're thin, and they've got a much lower volume than the rat myocytes, but they've got a much higher surface area to volume ratio, and that has implications for excitation contraction coupling. And this is one to show you a light micrograph. This is a macro myocyte, but just to show that despite the fact that there are no um, T tubules, you still have a very clear register of the, sarcom of the, um, the sarcomeres across the length of the cardiac myocyte. Okay, so but whether you're an um, endothermic or an ectothermic vertebrate, heart function is controlled by two main features. One, calcium cycling, and two, muscle length. 
Tyson cycling can be summarized by the processes of excitation contraction coupling, and length can be summarized by the length tension relationship. And so the two ideas that I wanted to tell you about today kind of relate to both of these major intrinsic control systems of the heart. First, the mysterious role of the sarcoplasmic reticulum relates to EC coupling, and the next is the exquisite sensibility or extensibility of the sarcomere from ectotherms, and that relates to the link tension relationship. And actually, both of these questions relate in some way to this relationship between heart rate, stroke volume, and maintaining adequate cardiac output. All right, so now to the first, the mysterious role of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, excitation contraction coupling is the process that links membrane depolarization with the calcium signal that causes contraction. And you can see that quite clearly here in this figure, where you've got an action potential in black leading to a, a rise in intracellular calcium, which causes the subsequent contraction of the myofilament. So that's the time course. You can think about it schematically by this version of a myocyte. So here's a myocyte, here's this myocyte cell membrane, here's the myofilaments inside, it's simplified. Here's the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is that intracellular calcium store, the Ryandium receptor and the circuit pump, which control the release and uptake of calcium, and the ion channels in the cell membrane. And so what happens is you get an action potential arriving at the myocyte that causes a depolarization of the membrane, which opens the calcium channels and allows calcium to come from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Now that process can cause calcium-induced calcium release, which means that this calcium trigger from the outside activates the Ryandium receptors and causes release of the intracellular calcium stores. Either alone or together with calcium-induced calcium release, you get a rise in intracellular calcium that causes the myofilaments to contract, and you get contraction. And then relaxation occurs this phase when the follow, there's a fall in intracellular calcium through the combined actions of calcium being taken back up into the SR through circa or across the cell membrane through the NCX. So from that, you can see there's two main sources of calcium. One, calcium that comes extracellularly across the sarcolemma, and two, intracellularly from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you look at across vertebrates, you see that in mammals, the extracellular influx is fairly small, but it, causes, it triggers a large release of calcium from the intracellular compartment. Whereas in ectotherms, the extracellular influx is fairly large, but it's very poor at triggering calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So in a sense, we've got calcium-induced calcium release in this condition, but no or very limited calcium-induced calcium release in the ectothermic heart, because the coupling between calcium influx from the outside and the inside is less. And because, of, because of this, ectothermic hearts seem to be less reliant on the SR for excitation contraction coupling. And that's been shown from a number of, of very simple studies using pharmacological agents to block the SR in a muscle preparation and looking what happens to force. But if you look across a number of different species, a pattern emerges. So here you can see in the dark blue is the percent contraction is, um, from the calcium release from the SR, and the light is from the sarcolemma, or calcium coming across the cell membrane. And you can see in the adult rabbit and the rat, sorry, rat, rabbit, you can see a high proportion of calcium from the SR, and a very low proportion of calcium coming across the sarcolemma. So this is calcium-induced calcium release. If you look across the ectotherms, you can see a, a variable but an interesting pattern emerg emerging, with a rounded lizard showing some calcium-induced calcium release, and less as you go down to a number of other species. The, the details of why this difference occurs is also a fascinating story, but I'm not going to be able to tell you about it today. But in any case, overall, endotherms about 60 to 95% of the calcium comes from the SR, whereas in ectotherms, 0 to 50% does. So the SR plays a variable but lesser role um, in EC coupling in the ectotherm heart than the endotherm heart. And those muscle studies have been confirmed by looking at studies of isolated um, myocytes. Here's some work from the turtle. This is by Gina Galli. And she showed that if you um, load the cells up with fewer 2 this is a ventricular cells from the yellow belly slider. You can see there's a very small depressive effect of um, SR blockade. Here's a granite lizard, a much more active reptile, and there is actually a more significant contribution of the SR in this animal than um, 
than in the turtle, but still less than compared to mammals. So the exotherms don't seem to be don't seem to be using the SR for calcium induced calcium release. So their EC coupling or their contractility is based on the extracellular calcium influx. So this is kind of confusing them because here you can see this is a, a line scan of a rainbow trout ventricular myocyte, and here's um, uh, the calcium rise during field stimulation. So you get an increase in calcium, and then you apply caffeine, which is um, able to release the calcium stores of the SR, and all of a sudden you get a large caffeine induced transient, suggesting there's quite a lot of calcium in this exotherm SR. And this is really surprising to us because from a lot of the studies, it seemed like the SR was not really contributing at all to EC coupling. And so this kind of provoked a flurry of studies where we looked at the calcium load in the SR of a number of ectothermic species, some of the pelagic species, some cold water species, and some hypoxic tolerant species. And the results were quite interesting. Actually, find out that the steady state calcium content in the ectothermic animals is three to nine fold greater than it is in the mammalian heart. Average about 400 micromoles of calcium per cell volume. So here's our adult rat and rabbit, but look at the amount of calcium that is able to be released from caffeine in these ectotherm hearts. A significant proportion. Now if you compare SR calcium, calcium utilization with this SR calcium content, there's a definitely a mismatch. Because here we've got what I showed you before with the SR calcium utilization. And here's the um, steady state contact, which I just showed you. And actually now overlaid is the maximal amount of calcium that you can actually put into the SR of these animals. And you can clearly see that, that first of all, there's a mismatch, but we can put a lot of calcium of the ectotherms hearts have the capacity to store tons of calcium in their SR. But they don't seem to release it. So there's the mystery. Why, why do ectotherm hearts hold so much calcium in their SR and not release it? What's going on here? So there have been quite a few studies trying to address this, and colleagues of mine in Finland have shown the fish ionin receptor, so this protein here that is, responds to that calcium trigger and in response releases its SR calcium load, it has a lower affinity. And so it probably is not as calcium responsive as um, the random receptor in mammals. And thus it's able to, um, it's less willing to open and release calcium from the SR. And so this may actually stabilize the receptors and raise the threshold for calcium release. So you can put more and more calcium in the SR before it releases. But you still have to consider though, if this threshold is at some point exceeded, it should generate a massive calcium transient. A calcium transient which, is, which would actually cause a, a, a huge contraction. And we know that doesn't happen. So there must, just as it's interesting to think there must be an effective mechanism other than stored depletion that, that terminates SR release in these ectotherm hearts. So is there a place where, where this calcium is released? Well, if we go back to the question about the animals being exposed to a number of environmental changes, pH changes, hypoxic changes, toxicants, temperature, perhaps the SR is acting as a calcium reservoir. So when the animals are stressed, they're able to recruit that calcium and then be able to use it to bolster excitation contraction coupling. I'm going to tell you two stories about that. One by my colleagues Caroline um, Cross and Fabian Brett, we did at Manchester, and another one about the brief container that we did in California. So to talk about Caroline and Fabian's work, first of all, what they did was they used inactivation of the calcium current to get a measure of calcium-induced calcium release from the SR. So what you can see here, these are calcium currents from rainbow trout ventricular myocytes. And what they've done is they've put a different buffers inside of the patch pipette to measure the currents. Here we've got EGTA, which is a slow buffer at two millimolar. Here we've got BACTA, which is a fast buffer at 10 millimolar. And here we've got barium. And barium's included just so it can show you the voltage dependent inactivation. And what happens is that when calcium comes in through the calcium channel, its inactivation is both voltage and calcium dependent. And so if there's calcium released from the SR in response to calcium influx, that will, that will speed up the inactivation. And so you'll be able to see a change in the inactivation profile of the current. BAPTA as a fast buffer should be able to chelate that 
And if there is calcium dependent inactivation, this should be able to get rid of it. But what you see is if you look at, if you normalize these values, the um, inactivation of the current with the slow buffer EGTA and with the fast buffer BAPTA, there's absolutely no difference. And so what that shows you is that uh, there's no calcium induced calcium release from the SR under basal conditions in the fish cardiac myocyte. So Carolyn Fabian thought, hmm, well, let's just check to make sure there's calcium in the SR, just as we had before. So here's control. This is um, Fura 2 calcium transient. So you can see under field stimulation, the cells releasing calcium. You apply caffeine, and you get a large release of calcium from the SR. So these trout ventricular myocytes have calcium in the SR. It's just not being released. So what we thought was, well, why don't we try and do something a bit sneaky? Let's, let's use beta adrenergic stimulation. Let's amplify the system and see what happens. And so what you can see is that by adding one micromolar isopaternal, which is quite a high level of, of, of um, stimulation, but you can see you increase the um, calcium transient, and you can also get a much larger caffeine-induced transient. So knowing now that isopaternal is increasing these features, what happens to calcium um, ICA inactivation in the presence of, iso of uh, beta adrenergic stimulation? All right, so here's a similar pattern to what I showed you before, where you've got the calcium current in the presence of EGTA, the slow buffer, the fast buffer, and we only have voltage dependent inactivation. And what you can see quite clearly is that there's a large difference between the EGTA and the BAPTA signals. And so this is telling us that when BAPTA is chelating that fast amount of calcium, so it's preventing SR calcium release from interacting with the, with the calcium channel, you get a slow inactivation. But in the absence of that, you get a biphasic fast inactivation, which is evidence for calcium-induced calcium release, which I think shows you that the calcium stores can be accessed in these animals under stressor-stimulated conditions. I think it's important to note that this recruitment strategy has lots of parallels to mammalian EC coupling. This is increasing trigger, this is increasing calcium load, and being able to utilize these calcium stores under an adrenergically stimulated condition. Okay, so that's a stressor. What about another feature that's perhaps more physiologically relevant to these organisms? Here, we come to the bluefin tuna. Now, this is an interesting study I did in California where we took these bluefin tuna and we actually acclimated them chronically to two temperatures. So taking huge animals and putting them in two massive tanks, one at 14 degrees and one at 24 degrees. The animals were left there for two months to acclimatize to these conditions. And then we isolated the hearts and looked at calcium transients at a common temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. And this is what we found. The cold acclimated fish consistently had um, faster and larger calcium transients than the warm acclimated fish when tested at a common test temperature. And this can be shown by the normalization and the overlay of these two uh, curves here with the cold and the warm, showing the faster rate and amplitude of the calcium transient after cold acclimation. Seems like it has to do with the SR. So what we did then was to take the cold fish myocytes and inhibit SR function. And what you can see is when you inhibit SR function in the cold myocytes, you get a slower rise and fall of the calcium transients. When we do this in the warm myocytes at a warm temperature, we don't see this response to SR inhibition suggesting that chronic cold increases SR calcium utilization in the bluefin tuna. Again, suggesting or showing that the ectothermic heart, the ectothermic SR can be accessed as a reservoir, additional reservoir of calcium when it's required. Of course, this is also similar to a mammalian strategy. We know from hibernating mammals that the role of the SR is increased during um, uh, cold temperatures. So to summarize the mysterious role of the SR in ectotherm hearts, I've shown you that ectotherm hearts store very large amounts of calcium in their SR, but they do not release it under routine conditions. But stressors, like beta adrenergic stimulation or chronic cold, can result in significant calcium-induced calcium release from the SR. And it's done by employing analogous strategies to those that found in mammalian hearts. But it's important that we don't still understand everything because when this calcium release occurs, it must be from a separate mechanism than that exists in mammalian hearts because it doesn't release the entire 
SR um, calcium, it just releases a very small fraction. And obviously more work needs to be done to understand how that really works. But I'll move on now to my second point, which is the exquisite sensibility of the fish sarcomer. And of course, this goes back to what I was trying to relate at the very beginning, where we've got two control mechanisms for the heart. One, excitation contraction coupling, and two, the length tension relationship. So this is an example of the length tension relationship. It's part of the um, French Stalin law of the heart. What you can see on this axis is tension as a percentage of maximum and sarcomere length on this axis. Um, what happens is that at a resting sarcomere length, you have a low amount, or at a, a slack sarcomere length, you have a low amount of tension. As the length of the sarcomeres, the Z lines are pulled apart, and you get um, a more favorable overlap of actin and myosin filaments, you get a rapid increase in the tension produced by the, um, the sarcomere, up to a maximum, beyond which any additional stretch is going to minimize actin and myosin overlap, and you get a fall in um, tension. And of course, this is key because um, as you increase length, that's like increasing blood flow into the heart. And so if you have increased blood flow to the heart, you have to have a stronger contraction to be able to release it. So in this way, the frank stallion relationship really links cardiac ejection with cardiac filling. So it's a fundamental property of the heart. And in mammals, this is about the operating um, region of the mammalian uh, sarcomere. So with a resting sarcomere length of about 1.8, up to a maximum of about 2.3. And you can see over this range, the animal is able to um, take advantage of this and be able to adjust cardiac output or force of the heart, force of contraction to the amount of stretch that's causing um, by blood flow coming into the heart. But what about, what happens in ectotherms? So I told you that they're really bad at increasing maximum frequency. And so if they want to be able to modulate cardiac output, they do it through stroke volume. So a threefold change in stroke volume, what implication would that have on this relationship? Well, when I was in, at White's lab, I think he did a back of an envelope calculation and said, Holly, a threefold increase in stroke volume would require a myocyte elongation of 40%. I don't think that's going to happen. Because what happens is if they have the same resting stroke in their length, that 40% extension is going to put the peak of our length tension relationship well on the descending limb of the length of the um, length tension relationship. So we wanted to actually test this idea and see what happens, how the whole heart changes in stroke volume related to what happens at the level of the single cell. And we did that, here's the uh, diagrams I showed you earlier, here's the rat myocyte, here's the trout myocyte, and here's another example of the um, uh, rat myocyte and trout myocyte, and this is now held between two carbon fibers. What you can see is that the sarcomere length at rest is the same in both 1.8 microns in both the fish and the mammalian myocyte. And what we did was we stretched the myocyte and wouldn't believe what happened. The fish myocyte stretched out to a really, really, really long length. I think I was screaming from the next room going, Ed, look at this. Fish myocytes are highly extensible. Where the mammalian myocyte can stretch to about uh, two microns, the fish myocyte, as you can see, is exceptionally stretchy. I've got a video to try and uh, highlight this. <coughs> so here's the myocyte between two carbon fibers. Here it's been stimulated to contract, so it's stimulating. And what you'll see, this is the carbon fiber that's measuring tension, and this is the one we're using to actually stretch the myocyte. So you'll see progressively we're stretching this, and you can see contractility, we're measuring the force. It's been uh, cut up and sped up um, to make this not a really long talk. You can see as <laughs> we keep stretching it, you can see the force of contraction is increasing. You can see the real extensibility of this trout. This is a trout ventricular myocyte. So you can really stretch it right out. Of course, if you stretch it too far, it does, unfortunately, dies. But what you can do with studies like this is that you can measure, because you're measuring the deflection here, you can actually look at the um, amount of force generated at each sarcomere length, and you can create a length tension relationship for a single cell. And so here for this cell that I just showed you, here is the, um, the, force, the time courses of the transients as, you, as the sarcomere stretch from 1.8 up to 2.5 um, microns. And you can see here the increase in force. Now if you do this a number of times for a number of different cells, 
you can plot a, 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 um, a figure like this. Or on this figure, we can show the relative force. And on this axis, we have the relative length. And what you can see is that for the mammalian myocytes, if you stretch them 10%, 20%, you can see the increase in force is similar between both the mammalian and the fish myocytes. What becomes quite clear is that the fish myocytes are able to be stretched out to much longer myocyte lengths. And in fact, very reassuring for us and for Ed's calculations was that you can see we can stretch the myocytes out to about 40% of their resting length and still be developing active force. Now, if we take this relative length and put some real numbers on it, you can see that we've really extended that length tension relationship. Here's slack, and here is where we're still developing active force. So the fish myocytes have a really extended ascending limb of the length tension relationship. So that suggests then that the threefold um, changes in blood volume that accompanies stroke volume modulation of cardiac output is accompanied by a sarcomere that can develop active force at really long lengths. So here's what I showed you for the rat, and it actually works out that it's true. We, do, we are able to extend the sarcomere length and develop active force of the fish up to very long lengths. But what's going on here? Because how come the fish is actually, it's, we're not at this length, in the fish, fish length tension relationship, force is still rising. And in the mammalian, force is falling. What underlies the functional difference in these ranges? Well, it's not myofilament length. I don't have the time to tell you, but it's not myofilament length. It's not a change in calcium. So really, we thought there must be a change in myofilament calcium sensitivity or differences in length-dependent activation of the muscle. And so um, my student went to um, work with both uh, John Kentish and with um, Olivia Crozola to try and assess this question. And what, what he did was he looked at, he skinned cardiac myocytes, so he removed the cell membrane, and then was able to wash in different levels of calcium. So this is calcium as a PCA, PCA, so it's the negative log of calcium. So a low number means a high amount of calcium. And a PCA of six is equal to one micromole. And so here's a rat held between two posts. One of them is a force transducer, and here's a fish held between two posts. And what you can see is that as you increase the amount of calcium, you increase activation of the muscle. And so what we were interested in doing was trying to figure out whether activation of these, these fish myocytes, or these myofilaments, was greater? Was it, was it larger? And was it able to compensate for being able to be um, stretched to areas that were definitely beyond myofilament overlap in the length tension relationship? And so what, he, what the first thing to do is to look at the activation of the myocyte at a maximum force, so a PCA of about five. What we did was that this, so this maximum active tension, comparing the fish and the, um, so this is the trout and a rat sarcomere. And what we found was quite interesting was that at low sarcomere lengths, or at round two, the rat develops greater active tension. But as we stretch the cell and go to longer and longer sarcomere lengths, again, this is not probably physiological for the rat, but it's physiological for the fish, we start to see an increase in maximum, um, in the force of the maximum tension in the um, trout myocyte. So maximum active tension is greater at um, long circumulate in the fish. So that's maximum though, that's probably, that level of calcium is probably not going to be physiological. But if we go to a physiological level of calcium, around 6.2 PCA, it's even more interesting, I think, because you start to see that even at the low level sarcomere lengths, you're developing more tension in the trout sarcomere than you are in the, the rat sarcomere. That indicates that the, the fish have a greater calcium sensitivity. And this is shown quite clearly here by these classic force PCA curves, where we've got four different curves showing the different sarcomere lengths, so 2, 2.3, 2.5, and 2.7. And you can clearly see the left shift of the curve indicating greater calcium sensitivity in the fish than the rat. And what's potentially not so obvious here, but it's quite obvious if you plot um, the PCA curves this way, the PCA50 curves this way, is that the fish myofilaments not only show a greater calcium sensitivity, but they also show greater length-dependent activation. So the increased calcium sensitivity gets larger as you go to longer sarcomere lengths. I think this is quite important because it, um, 
this inherent calcium sensitivity is important for probably for combating the effects of temperature because temperature has a direct relationship on calcium sensitivity to myofilaments and cold actually reduces myofilament calcium sensitivity. So what we have is a system potentially where the fish has a greater calcium sensitivity to combat its um, lifestyle living in cold temperatures. But there is a corollary or a caveat which I think is quite important and harkens back to the first part of the talk, which is this has implications for excitation contraction coupling. Because if you have a, it, this actually is fairly, um, the troponin, actually troponin C has got a greater calcium sensitivity in fish than mammals. And that greater calcium sensitivity means that it's harder to offload calcium from the myofilaments. And perhaps that's one of the features that causes a maximum limit to heart rate. Even when the fish are warm, they still have an inherent calcium sensitivity, so they can't offload their calcium from the myofilaments fast enough. So they've got a problem with fast rates. So increased calcium sensitivity at physiologically relevant calcium levels I think allows the fish sarcomere to be able to develop high tension at long lengths. And it explains the reason why we can actually develop active tension at these long lengths in the fish. I think this is vital for being able to maintain active force on the descending limb of a length tension relationship. So to summarize this part, the exquisite sensitivity or extensibility of the fish sarcomere um, is shown by the fact that the biofilaments from the from the fish are more calcium sensitive than they are from the mammals. At physiologically relevant calcium sensitivity or calcium levels, the sarcomere is developing greater active tension at long lengths, and this length dependent activation is greater in the fish than the mammalian myocytes, allowing them to be able to develop force as they go through these prolonged stretches that are required for um, volume modulation. And thus, this exquisite stretch sensitivity enables volume modulated cardiac output in these animals' hearts. Now, to harken back to the first part of the talk, which was the mysterious role of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what I think I showed you was that the ectothermic SR had a high capacity but a low sensitivity for release. And that's opposite to the endothermic SR, which had a low capacity and a high sensitivity for release. So, to remind you of the first part, then, the thing about the mysterious role was that there was a, this high capacity and low sensitivity versus low capacity and high sensitivity. I think you might be able to think of it as an evolutionary trade-off. So if you're a fish, you need stability for a changing environment, but it's at the trade-off of having a rapid calcium-induced calcium release and possibly also of being able to generate maximum uh, frequencies. So what I've really done is told you two stories which I think are very interesting about the fish heart. One about the role of the SR, but one other one about the extensibility of the sarcomere. And I think they hearken to two of the major control systems of the heart, which is changing calcium and changing muscle length. And I think that they are generated because of the fact that we need the role of the heart is to generate cardiac output. And changes in one are going to result in ultimate changes in the other. So I think they're pretty darn cool. And that's, I'll take some questions. I'd like to thank um, Ed White, Simon Patrick, Sarah Callahan, Olivia, Caroline, Fabienne, Gina, Barb, John, Anita, and the people who funded this. Thanks very much. <laughs>